In the intricate topic of neuropsychiatric disorders, Cotard syndrome emerges as a rare yet profoundly intriguing manifestation, blurring the boundaries between reality and distorted perceptions of self and existence. This essay delves into the intricacies of Cotard's delusion, a psychiatric syndrome characterized by the conviction of being dead or non-existent. Through the lens of real-world instances and clinical insights, we explore the multifaceted dimensions of the syndrome, its impact on individuals, and the underlying neurophysiological mechanisms at play. The exploration of Cotard syndrome extends beyond clinical realms, into the realm of art, as illustrated in Charlie Kaufman's 2008 film, Synecdoche, New York. The protagonist, Caden Cotard, is named after the neurologist in question, Jules Cotard. In the film, Caden grapples with a profound belief in his impending demise, mirroring the real-world experiences of those afflicted by Cotard's delusion. The cinematic narrative weaves a surreal tapestry, where Cotard's syndrome is not merely a plot device, but a poignant exploration of existential crisis. Scenes featuring his daughter's distressing realization about blood within her body, and the protagonist's gradual detachment from his own life's narrative, serve as metaphors for the complexities inherent in Cotard's delusion. As we unravel the layers of Cotard's syndrome, we draw parallels between the cinematic representation and clinical reality, shedding the light on the harrowing real-world horrors signified by the walking corpse syndrome. Through detailed narratives and clinical observations, we navigate the profound impact of the syndrome on individuals, offering insights into the delicate balance between the mind's intricate workings and the tangible reality it perceives. The narrative unfolds with an unidentified 57-year-old woman, previously engaged in selling traditional craft liqueur and devoid of any prior mental health issues. She encountered an enigmatic set of symptoms that ultimately led to her hospitalization in a psychiatric facility. The onset of her challenges can be traced back to November 2016, when she stumbled upon the revelation that her husband, with whom she shared over four decades of marriage, had engaged in an extramarital relationship. This discovery plunged her into profound emotions of sorrow and hopelessness. The woman had cultivated a prolonged practice of imbibing in a traditional craft liqueur known as viche, crafted from fermented sugarcane juice and boasting a 40% alcohol content. Over the course of more than two decades, she consistently indulged in viche every two weeks for several days, frequently reaching a state of inebriation. Additionally, she maintained a smoking habit, although the full extent of her cigarette consumption remained unclear. Her symptoms initially manifested as constipation and sudden abdominal pain. Her family noticed that she felt weak and claimed her body had become rigid and unresponsive. Over the subsequent two months, both she and her family actively sought medical assistance from different clinics and hospitals, primarily addressing persistent concerns related to the constipation, the abdominal discomfort, and a lingering lack of energy. Approximately five months after the initial appearance of her symptoms, the woman developed a conviction that she was in the process of dying, asserting that she was no longer alive. She described an unusual sensation of her body being frozen, attributing the condition exclusively to individuals who were either already deceased or teetering on the brink of death. Subsequently, in June 2017, she was directed for a psychiatric evaluation. Throughout the psychiatric evaluation, the patient persisted in articulating delusions concerning her belief in being deceased and the deterioration of her body. She reported a diminished appetite, respiratory challenges, and ongoing issues with constipation. Subsequently, she was admitted to a hospital and diagnosed with a depressive episode. Initially, her treatment regimen incorporated antipsychotics, followed by the subsequent inclusion of clozapine. In addition to her treatment, she was prescribed bipolar medication alongside an antidepressant. 
this combination yielded some positive outcomes, contributed to a ceasing of her delusional symptoms and an overall enhancement in functionality. Throughout her duration in the hospital, a series of diagnostic tests, including a brain MRI, were conducted in an effort to pinpoint the elusive root cause of her symptoms. Yet another vital narrative unfolds, recounting the experiences of a 77-year-old unmarried man who had been grappling with a diagnosis of chronic schizophrenia for a span exceeding three decades. His medical journey was intricate, marked by episodes of homelessness, a history of a fractured hip and elbow, elevated blood pressure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, and pulmonary emphysema resulting from extensive smoking since adolescence. Furthermore, he had confronted alcoholism for four decades until embarking on a path of recovery through Alcoholics Anonymous 15 years prior to the assessment. The course of the patient's life had been characterized by a progressive decline in functioning, a worsening of symptoms related to his mental illness, and sporadic employment, predominantly in sales before reaching the age of 40. Despite undergoing psychiatric interventions over the years, encompassing a variety of medications such as antidepressants, he continued to grapple with enduring delusions. These included convictions of being deceased and targeted by spiritual entities. He vocalized thoughts such as, I am aware that I'm no longer alive. Spiritual entities took my life because of my superior intelligence compared to others. His sister observed a heightened intensity of nihilistic delusions, particularly after he commenced attending Alcoholics Anonymous in 2002. Manifesting challenges in self-care, severe insomnia, reduced appetite, and a conviction that spiritual entities were contaminating his food and subjecting him to relentless persecution, he succumbed to a severe state of protein-calorie malnutrition and functional deterioration. This critical condition prompted his admission to a day hospital program in December of 2017. Despite a comprehensive clinical assessment, which included neuroimaging revealing no abnormalities, the resumption of his treatment with antidepressants yielded positive results. This was most evident in the improvement of his sleep patterns and overall behavior, with significant strides noted in terms of self-care and appetite. The third and final narrative sheds a more hopeful light on the likelihood of surviving Qatar's delusion. In an extraordinary account, a soldier named Warren McKinley endured 18 months in a state of what can be described as a walking corpse, gripped by a rare medical condition that led him to believe he was dead. This unique ordeal left him in a perplexing alternate reality, akin to feeling like a ghost. McKinley, aged 35, found an unlikely source of healing when he encountered another British soldier undergoing the exceptionally rare Cotard syndrome while receiving treatment at the Headley Court Rehabilitation Center. Warren, hailing from Braintree, Essex, vividly described his conviction of being deceased, manifesting as a belief that there was no purpose in eating since he was already dead. This surreal experience felt like residing in an alternate dimension, where he heard familiar voices like his father's, yet felt detached from reality. McKinley's journey into this unusual mental state commenced after a severe motorbike accident in 2005, which left him at Headley Court for recovery. Despite surviving the accident with a broken pelvis, back, and two ruptured lungs, his mental health took a perplexing turn. His family began noticing his altered behavior, marked by uncharacteristic rage, triggered by loud noises, or his daughter's cries. Warren struggled with memory lapses too, forgetting tasks and experiencing a blank period following the accident. As he spent his days surrounded by injured soldiers, he gradually developed the conviction of being a dead man walking. The belief that he no longer needed sustenance due to his perceived deceased state led to severe self-neglect, withdrawal, and a lack of communication. Eventually, McKinley opened up to a therapist about his belief in being deceased, leading to a diagnosis of Cotard syndrome. 
This revelation was initially met with disbelief and denial. But in a serendipitous twist of fate, Warren befriended another individual at the rehabilitation clinic who shared the rare Cotard syndrome diagnosis. This fellow sufferer adopted a new identity, believing that the old self was dead. Together, they provided mutual support, aiding in each other's recovery. Cotard syndrome, also called Cotard's delusion, is a rare psychological condition in which individuals believe they are missing body parts, dead, and or are non-existent, and sometimes think that nothing around them is real. The name comes directly from a French physician, psychiatrist, and neurologist, Jules Cotard. Born on June 1, 1840 in central France, Jules Cotard pursued medical studies in Paris and subsequently undertook an internship at Hospice de la Sépiviatrière. During his tenure, he collaborated with notable figures, including Jean-Martin Charcot. Cotard developed a keen interest in cerebrovascular accidents, commonly known as strokes, and their neurological consequences. To enhance his comprehension of the impact on the brain, he conducted autopsies. In 1869, Cotard departed, and during the Franco-Prussian War, he served as a regimental surgeon in an infantry regiment. Later, in 1874, he relocated to the town of Vanva, where he spent the remaining decade and a half of his life. His notable contributions extended to advancing the understanding of both diabetes and delusions. In 1880, delusions were at the forefront of his studies, when he coined the French term translating to the delirium of negation to describe a psychiatric syndrome with varying degrees of severity. In mild cases, individuals may exhibit feelings of despair and self-loathing, while severe cases are characterized by intense delusions of negation and chronic psychiatric depression. Cotard's prime case, the case of Mademoiselle X, illustrated a poignant example where the woman denied the existence of certain parts of her body and rejected the necessity to eat. She asserted that she was condemned to eternal damnation, rendering her incapable of experiencing a natural death. Tragically, in the throes of this delirium, Mademoiselle X succumbed to starvation. Did you know, though, that Cotard may not have actually been the one to discover the delusion named after him? Over 150 years before Mademoiselle X was studied by Jules, apothecary William Lilly wrote a series of letters regarding the Countess of Suffolk, Henrietta Howard, in 1750, highlighting bizarre behavior on behalf of the Countess. In a letter written around July 20th, Lilly wrote that when Lady Suffolk waked from her slumber, called out in a frightful manner for half an hour that she was deceased and a great deal of such language. The case continued with Lady Suffolk's initial bout of a raving fit, followed by a profound lethargy and the need for assistance, even with basic tasks. Lily, employing the medical practices of the time, bled her and applied various treatments, including blisters, pigeon application to her feet, and head shaving. Despite Lily's efforts, Lady Suffolk's symptoms persisted, marked by drowsiness, melancholy, and an unsettling religious delusion. Expressing a belief in her own damnation and asserting that she had been dead for some time, Lady Suffolk's mental state presented a perplexing challenge. Lily, concerned about her potential descent into lethargy or other brain-related disorders, continued administering treatments, including inducing her to flow through a glister, which produced significant stool and urine. The progression of Lady Suffolk's condition remained troubling, with intermittent improvements such as walking around her chamber, but an enduring melancholy in silence. Lily, recognizing the complexity of her disorder, suggested it might be mania, emphasizing the hysterical nature of the ailment. Despite Lily's persistence in highlighting the hysterical component, the physician, Sloan, began prescribing anti-hysterical medications later in the course of treatment. 
This historical account not only provides a window into Lady Suffolk's suffering, but also reflects the medical understanding of the time, where humoral theories and treatments were employed to address both physical and mental aspects of the disorder. The distressing religious delusions exhibited by Lady Suffolk find residence in the broader context of 18th century medicine, where similar cases were classified under hysteria or hypochondria, emphasizing the intertwining of physical and mental well-being at the diagnostic and therapeutic approaches of the era. In the years and decades since, Qatar's delusion is much better understood, and now often extends to an alarming breadth of intricate cases, with patients asserting the ability to perceive the scent of their own decomposing flesh and sensations of worms traversing beneath their skin. Intriguingly, the latter phenomenon parallels the recurring experiences of individuals enduring chronic sleep deprivation or grappling with amphetamine cocaine-induced psychosis. Paradoxically, the belief of being dead frequently intertwines with the sense of immortality within the patient's consciousness. Only around 200 cases of this syndrome are known worldwide, although its symptoms are extreme in most individuals with Cotard syndrome can improve with treatment. These patients often become socially withdrawn though and may stop speaking or hear voices that confirm their belief of being dead and some even refuse to eat or they attempt self-harm. This syndrome is frequently associated with other medical conditions affecting the brain, such as dementia, epilepsy, migraine, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, stroke, and bleeding outside the brain due to severe head injuries. Some experts suggest that Cotard syndrome results from two types of brain damage, one altering the individual self-perception and the other reinforcing this false belief. However, this theory is not universally accepted. Cotard syndrome can manifest at various ages with a higher incidence in individuals in their early 50s, often accompanied by a history of mental health issues like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, derealization, migraine, and substance abuse. Imaging tests often reveal some form of brain damage, such as stroke, tumor, blood clot, injury, or lesions in the parietal lobe in affected individuals. Typically, the syndrome manifests in three discernible stages. The initial phase, known as the germination stage, is marked by the emergence of depressive and hypochondriac symptoms. Subsequently, the blooming stage ensues, characterized by the onset of delusions of negation. The final stage, termed the chronic stage, involves the persistence of severe delusions and chronic psychiatric depression. Throughout these stages, the patient's capacity for self-care is significantly compromised, resulting in neglect in both physical health and personal hygiene. Notably, Cotard syndrome is considered a symptom of another underlying condition rather than a standalone disease, and it is not listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders called the DSM, the standard reference for mental health diagnoses. Diagnosis usually occurs after ruling out other disorders, such as Capra syndrome, in which individuals believe their loved ones have been replaced by imposters. In fact, the neurophysiological and psychopathological aspects of Cotard syndrome appear to be intertwined with issues of delusional misidentification. From a neurological perspective, Cotard syndrome, marked by the negation of the self, is believed to share a connection with Capra's delusion, the aforementioned disease where individuals perceive others as imposters. Both delusions are thought to arise from neural misfirings in the fusiform face area responsible for face recognition and the amygdala, associating emotions with recognized faces. This neural disconnection instills in the patient a sense that the observed face does not belong to the person it represents, leading to a lack of familiarity or recognition typically associated with it. Consequently, this phenomenon results in derealization, causing a disconnection from the environment. In the case where the observed face is that of someone known to the patient, it triggers the perception of that face as an imposter, or the aforementioned caprice delusion. 
However, when the patient gazes upon their own face, a detachment between the observed face and their own sense of self occurs, leading to the belief that they cease to exist, or the basis of Cotard syndrome. Furthermore, individuals with Cotard syndrome exhibit a higher incidence of brain atrophy, particularly in the median frontal lobe, compared to control groups. This intricate interplay between neural dysfunction, face recognition, and emotional association sheds light on the complex neurobiological underpinnings of Cotard syndrome. Cotard syndrome has also been documented as arising from an adverse physiological reaction to an antiviral drug, such as acyclovir and its prodrug precursor. The manifestation of Cotard syndrome symptoms correlated with elevated serum concentrations of CMMG, the principal metabolite of the medication. Notably, in cases where patients had compromised kidney function or impaired renal function, the persistence of delusional symptoms posed a risk despite the reduction in the medication's dosage. Interestingly, the resolution of the patient's self-negating delusions occurred rapidly, within hours of undergoing hemodialysis. This observation suggests that instances of Cotard syndrome symptoms may not invariably necessitate psychiatric hospitalization, as targeted medical interventions addressing the underlying physiological factors can lead to a swift alleviation of the condition. Medical professionals have various treatment options for Cotard syndrome, typically targeting the underlying medical issue. A combination of medications, including antipsychotics, anti-anxiety drugs, and antidepressants are often used. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, which involves sending small electric currents through the brain to alter its chemistry, may also be considered to alleviate some mental health symptoms. Additionally, talk therapy, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, or psychotherapy, can help individuals discuss their feelings and develop healthier thought patterns and behaviors. In exploring Cotard syndrome and its historical roots, we traverse a landscape where the boundaries of the mind's perception blur, revealing the interplay between mental health and the fabric of reality. From cinematic metaphors to the earliest documented cases, the affliction's journey unfolds as a testament to the delicate balance between physical and mental well-being. Cotard syndrome, with its harrowing delusions of non-existence, serves as a reminder of the profound mysteries embedded in the human psyche, beckoning us to unravel the enigma of the walking corpse syndrome and grasp the complexities of the mind's labyrinth.